He is one of the most powerful leaders in the world. What's it like to have a lot of money? First of all, it's very pleasant. It also gives you a degree of freedom and it also gives you a degree of power. power, power, power. With billions of dollars to his name and an organization that allows him to shape a country's culture, he's considered the world's puppet master. I am basically there to make money. I cannot and do not look at the social consequences of what I do. There's one thing that differentiates him from most elites. For Soros, money is a means to an end, not the end goal itself. One of your money manager told us, George really does think he's a god. <laughs> so what happens when power falls into the wrong hands? He can move world financial markets simply by voicing an opinion or destabilize a government by buying and selling its currency. This man is uh, a carnivore of the first order. The world needs to be protected from people like George Soros. It is 1936, three years remain until the outbreak of the Second World War, as Hitler's power and influence surges in Germany, anti-Semitic discrimination throughout Europe is increasing exponentially. In Hungary, Tivador Schwartz, a fellow Jew, has an intuition that things are destined to escalate. He was a prisoner of war in Russia, right. and he escaped, and he lived through the Russian Revolution, and he came back from that a changed man. Uh, because, you know, he, he saw uh, this uh, turmoil, you know, he, uh, fighting and I mean, he went through a horrendous experience. After being a prisoner during the First World War and a refugee for three years in Russia, he figures that his life and that of his son George are in great danger. Despite the bleak situation, Schwartz has an idea. If he can eliminate all the Jewish markers from both of their identities, there is a good chance that he and his beloved son will survive any possible threat the war could bring. Very quickly, the idea turns into action. Some months later, Tivador sells his real estate assets and <clears throat> influences Hungarian authorities to acquire false non-Jewish identity certificates. Despite facing a lot of adversity, he eventually succeeds. That day, a legendary surname is born, a surname that will inspire finance connoisseurs and conspiracy theorists alike. Tivador and George are no longer Schwartz, but have now changed their surnames to Soros instead. A word from the Esperanto language that means will soar and alludes to Tivador's life of overcoming constant struggle, true megalomania. In 1939, the Second World War breaks out. Commanded by Austrian painter Adolf Hitler, the Nazis begin the biggest act of violence in the history of humanity, the Holocaust. Yet, it isn't until five years after the outbreak of the war that Tivadar's fears become a reality. In 1944, Nazi Germany finally arrives in Budapest with one clear goal in mind, the genocide of all Hungarian Jews. Despite their changed identities, Tivadar still feels that George's life is in danger. In times of war, nobody is safe. This keeps him awake at night. So he decides to take an even riskier safety measure. According to some new falsified documents, George Soros has always been the adopted Christian godson of a powerful non-Jewish
Jewish-Hungarian family. As a result, he now has access to the best security in the country and is finally safe from the Nazis. At only 14 years old, Soros witnesses the horrors of war from afar. Only one year after the Nazi invasion started in Hungary, more than 400,000 Hungarian Jews are killed. George experiences true terror, but unlike any of the children his age, he is still able to see the positive in the negative. As the Second World War ends only one year later, in September of 1945, Soros makes a surprising declaration. He regards the Second World War as the best time of his life. The reason is... unexpected. He is incredibly grateful to have been able to witness his father being a leader while risking his own life for the sake of his family. Without noticing, the Second World War would shape George's character and future actions to an extent that he is unable to comprehend at the time. After seeing the cruelty of life at such a young age, his path in life is now set before his eyes. Not only does he want to become an admirable leader like his father, but he also wants to obtain the necessary power to someday make the world a place free of war and conflict. Nonetheless, two years after the end of the war, a new problem strikes back at the Soros household. Due to the partial destruction of Hungary, Tivador, similar to many FX trading gurus, finds himself in an extremely tough financial situation. The aftermath of the Great War makes him unable to find a high-paying job that would provide the necessary amount of money to sustain his family. Even with help from the government, nothing works for him. So George takes a step forward towards his newfound calling with a brave decision. He will leave Hungary to immigrate to London and start his life from scratch as an independent adult. He is certain that, by doing so, he will alleviate the financial burden of his father and family by covering all of his living costs by himself. Anxiety and uncertainty fill his mind. He doesn't know exactly how he will make it, but something even stronger inside of him tells him that he will find a way. Maybe it's the knowledge that he's Tivadar's son. As Soros arrives in London, he immediately finds himself in great trouble. Despite his determination, he has no money and can barely speak any English. As a means to survival, he relies on the support from Jewish charity organizations for financial aid and housing. In just a few days, Soros finds a room at a boarding house with other young immigrants. Now that he has a bed and a place to stay at, he immediately starts looking for a job to sustain himself financially. What inspires megalomaniacs about people like like Soros is their constant drive forward. They don't spend time dwelling about their difficult lives. Like millions of other mildly successful midwits, they take 100% responsibility for their life and take action. As England rebuilds itself after the Great War, there is a high demand for human labor in blue collar jobs, a perfect opportunity for Soros to finally become an independent adult. His burning conviction provides results quickly. Just some days after the start of his search, Soros begins working as a railway porter at a train station. With great pride, he handles luggage, checks tickets, answers passengers' questions and cleans the station during every 8-hour shift. It is certainly not the job of his dreams, but he understands that it is just a stepping stone to accomplish his future ambitions. After working for minimum wage for some months, Soros has now achieved his first goal, becoming an independent adult. Yet, as soon as he completes his first big challenge, the next one manifests strongly within him. Once he saves enough money and perfects his English, he will go to college and become a respectable professional like his father was before the war. Tivadar Soros studied law at Franz Josef University in Kolosvar, Romania, and became one of the most respectable lawyers in Europe. Not only that, he also played a pivotal role in the spread of the Esperanto language after World War I. His goal 
goal was admirable. Tivadar believed that by the world having a common language, people in positions of power would be able to understand each other to a greater extent. According to his vision, this would reduce conflict, wars would be avoided and ultimately lives would be saved. Through his efforts, Tivadar managed to spread the Esperanto language across Europe and inspires a future generation of Esperantists. Sure, today nobody cares about Esperanto, but back then it inspires George. He learns the language and shares the philosophy. Even though Tivadar doesn't accomplish the impact that he expects from Esperanto, he achieves something even bigger after passing away in 1968. As George Soros obtains power later on in his life, the same desire to change the world would finally be manifested for the world to experience. The question is, is he changing the world for good or for worse? Just one year after starting to work as a railway porter, Soros thinks in advance and makes a smart move. He decides that he will switch jobs and start enjoying performance-based pay. He's not becoming a billion dollar hedge fund manager yet, he becomes a waiter. He figures that he will earn a higher income through tips and that the nature of the job will allow him to further improve his English to an extent where he will be able to thrive at university. One year later, in 1947, his vision becomes a reality. Not only is he completely fluent now, but Soros has also managed to save up enough spare money to attend nighttime classes at the prestigious London School of Economics. Even though he is still not following a career, he is becoming wiser, expanding his network and getting ready for his eventual career path. As with so many other things, Europe is lagging behind the US when it comes to prestigious universities. But there are a few proper ones that are considered target unis for the global finance elite. For example, INSEAD, LBS or obviously University of Mannheim. Or the famous LSE. It's almost guaranteed to set you up for a promising career. Two full years of work have now gone by and Soros has saved enough money to pay for a full year of undergraduate tuition at LSE. In 1949 he is accepted. Yet, despite all of his efforts, he doesn't have any time to celebrate. Soros has to keep working to sustain himself and save up even more money for next year's tuition. His life has become a constant fight, but he doesn't complain about it in the slightest. Compared to what his father has endured, this is nothing, he thinks. The shortage of money, money was very serious. It was very important for me to make a living. I developed my philosophy in college while I was also earning my way uh, through college by working in various jobs. For instance, I had a, as a waiter in a nightclub while I was studying during the day. As he enters his first year of college, Soros has a clear path in mind. After finishing the foundational year, he will major in economics to one day reach the highest paying jobs in the market. However, things drastically change when he starts his foundational year at LSE. As he takes a philosophy class during the first semester and meets his professor Karl Popper, his whole purpose in life suddenly takes a transcendental turn. As Popper teaches him about his theory of an open society, Soros' eyes glow up, his stomach sinks and his future becomes crystal clear before his eyes. Wie Sie sagen, es heißt die offene Gesellschaft und ihre Feinde. Die Feinde sind hauptsächlich die Faschisten, die Nazis und aber auch die, die kommunistische Diktatur, ob zwar die kommunistische Diktatur ja damals mit uns verbündet war. Und was ich bei der offenen Gesellschaft gemeint habe, war eine Gesellschaft, sagen wir, in der man frei atmen kann, frei denken kann, in der ein, jeder Mensch einen Wert hat und in der die Gesellschaft keine überflüssigen Zwänge über die Menschen aus Popper's leftist ideal of an open society has a profound impact on Soros' life from that moment onwards. After being face to face with the Nazi fascist regime, he now clearly understands who his enemies are. As a result, his goal is now to promote a form of governance that stops dictatorships and rigid beliefs from taking over in society. Like Popper, 
He seeks a world filled with equality, where people can think freely, act outside of conservative values and make their own choices in life. He believes that, by doing that, the world would be a much more peaceful place. An open society aligns with left-wing ideology. It emphasizes inclusivity, tolerance and protection of an individual's rights. On the other hand, a more right-wing view focuses on preserving traditions, maintaining a strong sense of national identity and prioritizing order and authority. After learning from Popper during his first year, Soros actively decides that he no longer wants to become an economist, but rather a philosopher like his now mentor. His goal in life is now finally clear to him. What he desires more than anything in this world is to do whatever it takes to propel Popper's vision and ideals of an open society. They have inspired him to a level that he cannot even comprehend at the time. This is very interesting because many people have these ideals. They want to make the world a better place, spread their ideals, whatever. But they fail to realize that the best way to do this is not to live an average life and do some charity work. The best way is to get massively rich and then allocate massive amounts of capital to whatever purpose you are pursuing. As he graduates from LSE in 1952 with only 22 years of age, Soros faces a new problem. Working opportunities for philosophers are scarce and badly paid. Soon, he figures that if he wants to reach his goals, he has to work in an industry where he's granted power. And where can he get the most power? Business and finance, the money-making industry. Once convinced of this change, Soros writes letters to the managing directors of all banks in London. He spends countless hours doing this and yet the results are extremely discouraging. No after no. He is consistently rejected for a year. In the meantime, he has to work more odd jobs to simply make a living. As his first job after graduating, he becomes a traveling salesman for toy and gift wholesalers. He struggles, but after two years of persevering with his applications, one bank decides to believe in him. Singer and Friedlander. Let's also not forget that these were different times. There were no career consulting programs, no case study coachings, no five rounds of selection interviews in order to be allowed to sell your life to an investment bank. If you had some kind of degree from some semi-proper university and then you hustled out enough applications, chances were you would get some kind of finance job. In 1945, George Soros starts his career in finance at Singer and Friedlander as a junior trader in the arbitrage department. Here, he buys and sells securities across different markets. Despite lacking background knowledge on his day-to-day -day tasks, his determination and willingness to learn keeps him on the job. Besides, even today's professional securities traders often seem like they have no clue about what they are doing. After only two years and a lot of determination and hard work, everything changes for good. Soros is not only thriving in his position, but he's also known for being one of the most promising talents in the industry. It is during this time, and at only 24 years old, that he finally makes a respectable living. The days of doing odd jobs and constantly having to worry about money are finally over. At this point Soros is a lot better off than many of the trading gurus you see online giving outdated or subpar advice. Listen. Soros is living proof that trading can be extremely profitable with the right strategy. For example, with the dollar carry trade. This isn't just theory either. Researchers backtested this strategy over 20 years of forex market history. I've put together a free guide that breaks down the dollar carry trade with performance metrics like max drawdown, profit factor and win rate. So you know exactly what to expect, whether you want to become a full-time trader like Soros or just do it as a side hustle. Click the link in the description below and just get this guide for free. Yet despite his early success, something can't stop lingering at the back of his mind. If he truly wants to obtain the necessary power to make great impact on society, these positions won't be enough. If he wants to reach the top of the world, he has to leave London and head to the capital of money. Many judge his thinking and don't see why a risk like that is worth it. At the end of the day, staying in London would guarantee him a respectable living, but his vision and determination see far beyond comfort. So, Soros follows his gut once again and, 
In the fall of 1956, he quits his job, goes against everyone and buys his second one-way ticket to the capital of finance. The American economy is booming. Victory in the Second World War has led to a period of economic growth, low interest rates and low unemployment. There appears to be consensus within the business and finance community that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for anyone to become rich. There is no denying it, the American dream is more alive than it has ever been. With the money he saved working at Singer and Friedlander, Soros moves to a one bedroom apartment in New York City, the world capital of finance. Now, he focuses on getting his first job so that he can finally start his journey to the top. Thanks to his experience in London, Soros realizes that he has a competitive advantage in low-priced European stocks. So after a successful interview with an American shark, he quickly lands a job at FM Meyer, a brokerage firm that specializes in trading European stocks and arbitrage. During the 1950s, these were extremely popular for US investors, because the old continent recovered itself from world World War II. For three years, Soros thrives in the firm and now makes a much greater income than that of his time in London. Only 28 years of age, Soros will no longer have to worry about his living expenses or sending money back home to his family. Deal after deal, trade after trade, his bank account expands. On the other side of the world, Tivadar and his family are extremely proud of George and know that this is just the beginning of his path to greatness. Likewise in England, Karl Popper is also extremely proud of his student and knows that it is just a matter of time before George makes the vision he laid down before him a reality for the world to witness. Back in America, Soros keeps thriving. Not only is his income growing, but also his reputation. Within the finance community in New York, he is now no longer considered a beginner. He is a European shark. Not only is he a master at European stocks, but at this point in his career, he has also built a solid understanding of all the important financial markets. That, in addition to his fearless and extroverted personality, makes him the ideal candidate to be already working at the pinnacle of world finance. Later that year, in 1959, Soros receives an outstanding job offer at Wertheim & Co, a renowned bank based in New York. The salary is way higher, even rivaling the highest in America, yet the pressure and stakes of working in that environment are as high as the reward. A mistake in that position can cost the bank millions of dollars and ruin one's reputation if not handled correctly. Yet, without thinking about it too much, Soros does doesn't shy away from the opportunity and welcomes it with open arms instead. He believes that three years in one firm is enough and that it is time to take the next step forward in his career. When he joins Wertheim & Co as an analyst, he is placed in the Department of European Securities, the area where he is now considered to have one of the biggest competitive advantages on Wall Street. As expected, he thrives again, closing millionaire deals and trades. However, this time Soros merits go far beyond his success in the office. During his time at Wertheim & Co, Soros starts applying a critical theory that he began thinking about during his time at LSE, a theory that would shape finance and that made him billions some years in the future, the theory of reflexivity. These distorted views can influence the situation to which they relate because false views lead to inappropriate actions. That's the principle of reflexivity. And so let's disentangle this for a second. The main insight that Soros brings to the table is that market distortions work in both directions. Not only do market participants operate with a bias, think a typical Robin Hood trader, but their bias can also influence the course of events. Think pumping GameStop to the moon. This may create the impression that markets anticipate future developments accurately, but in fact it is not present expectations that correspond to future events, 
but future events that are shaped by present expectations. And this, ladies and gentle silverbacks, is what Soros calls reflexivity. You just learned about George Soros most important theory. Congrats, you can now name drop reflexivity and impress other people in finance. As George Soros differentiates himself from the typical finance employee, more and more offers start arriving at his desk. There is no doubt about it, the world of finance seems to be in constant fight for Soros and the value that comes with hiring him. In 1963, at 33 years old and with now 10 years of experience in finance, he's offered a multi-millionaire contract as vice president of Anhold and S. Bleischröder, one of the most renowned investment banks at the time. And as someone who always welcomes change and bigger challenges, he accepts. A vice president is kind of the most junior of the senior bankers. So for clients and higher ups, that's like the first legitimate title. Where now you're not just an Excel monkey anymore, you are an individual with your own opinions. The life of an investment banking vice president mainly centers around two responsibilities, today and back then. Completing pitch books and managing client relationships. For some people in finance, reaching the vice president status will be enough to settle down. Yet for Soros, things are just getting started. The dream that he had envisioned with Karl Popper after the Second World War is closer than ever, so he won't give up on it just now in exchange for a comfortable life. In 1969, after six successful years at Anhold and S. Bleischröder, Soros makes a surprising decision that would change the course of his career to even bigger heights. He believes that he already has all of the necessary knowledge to start his hedge fund and become his own boss. As he relays his vision to his superiors at Anhold, they immediately counter him with a tempting new offer. They are willing to give him an extra six million dollars as an investment in exchange for them being founders of the fund and having equity. Soros knows those extra millions will make a substantial difference, so he decides to accept the offer. In the fall of 1969, his famous Double Eagle hedge fund is born. Soros has a simple and investment proposition to start with. Within the real estate market, he will look for a boom-bust trend, a strategy that he invented during his previous years as a trader. He predicts that a new trending investment vehicle called Real Estate Investment Trust will crash in three years. But until then, it will keep increasing its value. So. Soros decides to buy thousands of dollars worth of REITs on the way up in the present and short them on the way down three years into the future. A real estate investment trust is a company that owns, operates or finances income generating real estate. They allow individuals to invest into large scale properties like office buildings, shopping malls and apartments without having to buy the property themselves. REITs must distribute at least 90% of their taxable income to their shareholders. They do that through dividends and that makes them very attractive to income focused investors. And they can be traded on major stock exchanges. His plan works perfectly. Just as he anticipated, Soros makes $1 million on the way up and more than double on the way down. The results are exceptional. By repeating this strategy in different markets, the Double Eagle Fund valorizes itself to more than $50 million by 1973. At this point, Soros takes a look back at everything he has achieved. The kid with big dreams has now become a man who is about to be on top of the world. Most importantly, he is now face to face with the goal he set for himself a long time ago now. With power at the tip of his fingers, what is about to go down in the years to come is everything he ever wished for, to change the world for good and make the open society ideology a reality in the world.
At this point in his life, Soros has everything a man could ever wish for. Money, power, a beautiful wife, children, a loving family, a nice house and a job he is truly passionate about. Yet, despite seemingly having everything, there are some things about his personality that he simply can't ignore, his desire for more. It is now the fall of 1973 and with 51 years of age, Soros has an important realization. His intuition and skills are way ahead of anybody else on Wall Street. He has surpassed the skill level of his co-founders at Double Eagle Fund and is now in a league of his own. Soros now feels like he's being constrained by the other stakeholders at his hedge fund and starts regretting his decision to work with them in the past. This is a thought he cannot escape, a thought that keeps lingering in the back of his mind even if he tries to ignore ignore it. As a result, Soros concludes that if he wants to amass enough power to manifest Karl Popper's ideals to the world, he will have to have more freedom and own a larger percentage of profit from his trades. Soros believes in the power of aggressive and more risky trading strategies that aren't accepted by the board at Double Eagle. His train of thought leads him to the inevitable conclusion. He will start his hedge fund where he is the one and only boss. The decision is finally made. Only a few months later, Soros decides to start his hedge fund, Soros Management Fund. Yet, this decision wouldn't make his co-founders at Double Eagle happy. After an intense exchange of arguments, they reach a fair conclusion. Soros offers them to transfer all of their money to his new Quantum Fund, a fund that would belong to the umbrella company Soros Management. At Quantum, Soros promises that he will take care of their money and deliver them with their respective profit share as investors of the company. In other words, the only thing that changed from the time they worked at Double Eagle is Soros' role and the name of the fund. That way he is no longer betraying his colleagues and is getting exactly what he wants. However, to manifest the vision he had for Quantum, Soros soon realizes that he is not able to do the task all by himself, even if he wishes to do so. The operations are too complex and time consuming. Not only that, the opportunity cost of Soros not focusing on his trading strategy is worth millions of dollars a day. For that, he needs help from a business partner, someone he can trust, someone who understands him and, more than anything, someone who shares his vision. Soros eventually concludes that there is only one man for the job. Jim Rogers is an American investor who joined Arnold and S. Bleischroeder in 1970 and immediately sparked Soros' attention. Raised in Demopolis, Alabama in the 1940s, Jim Rogers faced numerous hardships due to the lingering effects of the Great Depression. His struggle gave him a unique motivation. Like Soros, he has always had an innate desire to become the very best. Not only that, his numerous life experiences as an investor in finance led him to have a very similar holistic and global view of the financial market, just as Soros. As a result, he can quickly understand his long-term vision with his project and the numerous investment strategies at Quantum Fund. He's the ideal right-hand man to help Soros grow his vision and empire. So the empire begins to expand rapidly and flawlessly. The key strategy that defined Quantum Fund's early success was heavily influenced by the current president, Richard Nixon. In 1971, he decides to change how the entire monetary system works by decoupling the US dollar from the gold standard. This is a countermeasure to alleviate the current chaos in the US economy. During the 70s, it finds itself in a recession due to the residual effects of the Vietnam War. The value of the dollar devalued, there is a high degree of stagflation, and unemployment is on the rise. The Nixon shock refers to a number of economic measures that have been taken by US President Nixon in 1971. And it was most notably the unilateral decision to end the convertibility of the US dollar to gold. This effectively ended the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates. And this of course led to a system of floating exchange rates and a lot of changes in economic policies. Both in the US as well as abroad, the financial markets would never be the same again. 
Despite the chaos for regular citizens, Soros and Rogers find a very smart way to profit from the situation. They have a plan. Earlier than anyone, they predict that the banking sector is due to fall. Since banks needed money to survive the recession, they would eventually sell many shares at an extremely low price. Time goes by and the duo waits for a worthy entry. On the day of the crash, Soros and Rogers buy millions of dollars worth of cheap bank shares. The result? are almost immediate. In less than a year, Soros and Rogers realize a 50% profit from their initial investment and add millions of dollars to their portfolio. This single move sparks a decade of unprecedented growth. During the next few years, the quantum fund shifts its focus to making money through trading international stocks. Due to their similar upbringing, the holistic worldview that Soros and Rogers share gives them the biggest competitive advantage in this this type of trading. They are extremely familiar with the European, American and Asian markets. So during the rest of the 70s, Soros, Rogers and their team invest millions of dollars in Dutch, French and Japanese stocks. Their moves are now even bolder than before and surprise all of their competition on Wall Street. The successful trades continue and at one point Soros manages to invest one third of his portfolio into Japanese stocks. This would have been his riskiest trade up until that point. In less than a year, Soros doubles his money and makes millions overnight. By the time the 1980s arrive, the Quantum Fund is already managing around $381 million in assets, a 3000% increase from the start of its days for all of the investors. Numbers that have never been seen before, Soros is now making history on Wall Street and is heading to becoming one of the very best in history. However, during a rainy night in 1986, the duality of life strikes back at Soros. He receives a discouraging call from Hungary that reveals a harsh reality before his eyes. His father, Tivadar, has passed away. Soros is shocked and can't believe what he's hearing. As the call progresses, his mother makes a powerful statement. Before the day of his death, Tivadar made one thing very clear to his family. He is extremely proud of his son George and everything that he has achieved. He has become the pride of his family and he can now die in peace, knowing that his son will bring peace to his family for generations to come. This call is a turning point in Soros' life. It motivates him even further to keep going and to make his and Karl Popper's vision a reality. He has no roots. He is stirring up trouble. His money is difficult to trace. It's all anti-Semitic imagery, Soros the Jew, the boogeyman of the 21st century. In 1979, with only 49 years of age, George Soros starts donating millions of dollars into his first of many philanthropic projects. These donations always have the same noble cause, to give equal opportunities to the marginalized classes and bring about a society that revolves around justice, fairness and equality. He starts giving away scholarship schemes for black students at the University of Cape Town and to Eastern European dissidents to work and study in Western countries. This is not a coincidence. If you think about it, Soros is giving away the same things that propelled his career forward. Plane tickets, job opportunities and a godly education. These actions directly mirror his roots. He strongly believes that people can do more than what they can imagine if they are just granted a chance, just like all the privileged have one. He strongly believes that people can do more than what they can imagine if they are just granted a chance. If he could get this far from the depth of hell, anybody can. That is the spirit that motivates and propels him forward. 
However, to the surprise of many, it would be the start of his philanthropic endeavors that would one day make Soros the biggest enemy of the right and presumably the orchestrator of destructive leftist ideology narrative. However, back in the present, during the fall of 1979, Soros' life would face a major setback after decades of success only. Inflation has increased by 8% compared to the year before and the macroeconomic situation is the worst it has ever been. The Fed intervenes and raises interest rates to an extent that has never been seen before. At the same time, the dollar starts losing its value and unemployment is increasing substantially. The Fed chairman at the time, Paul Walker, figures that the only way to fix the economy is to keep increasing interest rates despite the soaring unemployment. At Quantum Fund, Soros remains calm and starts ideating a plan to profit from this situation. His thoughts lead him to one conclusion, to use the yield curve to his advantage. Soros is certain that Paul Walker's action will spell doom to the US economy. The way the Fed increases the interest rate is by selling the treasury bills at the market, sometimes at a lower price. Thus, the interest rate will increase. Soros is expecting an inverted yield curve to happen. The inverted yield curve happens when there's a stronger demand for long-term bonds versus short-term bonds and stocks. That's exactly what Soros expects to happen. So he goes long on long-term bonds and so short of stocks and short-term bonds. The yield curve is a graph that shows the relationship between interest rates and different maturity dates for a set of similar bonds. Typically, those are US Treasury bonds. It usually slopes upwards. That means that longer-term bonds have higher yields than shorter-term bonds. But because, of course, they have higher risk and uncertainty over a longer period of time. And then there's the well-known inverted yield curve. Here, short-term rates are higher than long-term rates and typically that means there is economic trouble ahead or maybe even a recession. As a result of his lecture of things, Soros goes long on long-term bonds and short on stocks and short-term bonds. Yet, the results are discouraging. To the surprise of many, he loses his giant bet. The economy remains strong despite the outcome that he had anticipated. Soros, completely broken, totals a loss of $80 million after giving up and selling his position for more than half in 1980. This loss sparks a negative momentum. In only one year, Soros has lost 22% of the total portfolio of his firm. For the first time, his investors are furious. They can't believe what happened and start losing confidence and turning their back to George Soros. They call his strategies too risky and for the first time start doubting his ability. Maybe he is past his prime. Maybe he just got lucky is what investors and doubters start whispering to each other. Time goes by before the next big trade and tension increase with each passing day. Many lose confidence and prefer to allocate their resources elsewhere. As a result, half of his investors step out and do not want anything to do with Soros fund management or his quantum fund. It is over. Soros is extremely hurt. His ambition has always been to help people and now he's just hurting many families with every loss. The pressure and tension are too much for him to handle. This experience has taught him a life-changing lesson that comes with running your hedge fund and the burden that comes with managing other people's money. He thinks, meditates, and eventually arrives at a disappointing conclusion. With billions in his bank and a fortune that would last many generations, Soros decides that it is time to take a break from finance and change his focus to philanthropy. I was walking on the street from one bank to another trying to make the arrangement and I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized this tension to make money is really not worth it if it's going to kill me. That's when I decided to actually change course, when I decided to actually return to philanthropy. 
As Soros partially leaves his fund in 1980, he leaves his CEO position in the hands of James Marcus, a 33-year-old mutual fund manager with great experience in the industry of hedge funds. Despite investors being skeptical about this decision, they are proven wrong very quickly. The year after Soros' partial retirement, he achieves a 56.9% return and gains back the confidence of many investors. Maybe what Quantum Fund needed was a fresh mind and a strong conviction, which is what Wall Street giants started thinking. From that moment onwards, George Soros has a more indirect and seasonal role at Quantum Fund for decades to come. Some years he solely focuses on an increasing amount of philanthropic projects, like supporting the exchange of ideas in communist Hungary, funding academic visits in the West, or promoting open societies in the former Soviet bloc and China. Yet, when his management fund is not having a good time and needs his expertise to succeed, he goes back to restore the confidence of his investors. For example, in 1983, Marcus only managed to bring about a yearly return of 25% and a disappointing 9% the year after. As investors start to lose confidence, Soros makes a comeback at Quantum in 1985 and achieves an immaculate return of 122%. That same year, by shorting European stocks, the profit around $93 million. Now, if you think back at the beginning of this documentary and think about the character development that Soros goes through, the fact that he can just come in and make millions in a year is just out of this world. For the next years after 1985, Quantum Fund changes its trading strategy. Instead of focusing on trading stocks, they now start specializing in shorting and longing country currencies. Soros and his fund use macroeconomic indicators as well as their intuition for their analysis. As Soros has a strong international background and powerful connections around the globe, he finds that he has a strong competitive advantage in this field. In 1992, at 61 years of age, Soros makes the most emblematic trade of his career. After an extensive analysis, Soros concludes that England's participation in the European exchange rate mechanism is unsustainable due to high interest rates, an overvalued pound and Germany's reunification. Therefore, he decides to short the British pound on September 16, 1992, a historic day in the history of finance and, for some, the very pinnacle of his financial career. The government has concluded that Britain's best interests are served by suspending our membership of the exchange rate mechanism. As a result, the second of the two interest rate increases that I sanction today will not take place tomorrow and minimum lending rate will be at 12% until conditions become calmer. Soros makes $1 billion in only one week and destabilizes the entire British economy by devaluing the pound to extremely low levels. History is made on that day, a day that will be remembered for eternity. The shock was such that the 16th of September of 1992 will always be remembered as Black Wednesday or the day Soros broke the Bank of England. It was an ironic day after Soros as well, given that he now becomes a sort of antagonist to the country that gave him everything to start his career. The tables have turned. That bet was, is avail has been available for the last 10 years and uh, it only paid off at, at that particular moment. Then he spent the next few months giving it away, sometimes a hundred million dollars at a time. George has always said that he makes his money in the West and spends it in the East. With that incredible win, the billions Soros has in his bank allow him to invest more and more money into his philanthropic endeavors. In 1993, one year later, Soros figured out that if he wants to change the world at a large and meaningful scale, he would have to create and formalize his philanthropic efforts by establishing a foundation. He has a valid argument. By having a formal organization, it would be much easier to donate his money to large groups of marginalized people, get loans from governments, scale, and ultimately achieve his goal of an open society. A lot of billionaires love them for avoiding taxes or transferring wealth between generations. So, later in 1993, his philanthropy organization is born. The name? 
the Open Society Organization, a symbol that incarnates the ideals of his master Karl Popper and the conviction of his father, yet more importantly, it would showcase Soros' inherent resolve to bring about a more fair, just and equal world, fulfilled with opportunities for everyone, a world free from inequality. For the next few decades, the Open Society Foundation grows exponentially. After being founded, he invests a total of $880 million into his own university, the Central European University. By doing so, he can extend his ideology to students students from all over the world. At the same time, he's also donating hundreds of millions of dollars in humanitarian aid for the wars in Yugoslavia. This way, he can help the thousands of innocent people who lost their homes or their resources, an action that directly mirrors his situation after the Second World War. However, despite his efforts, Soros also suffers a lot of criticism. Finance experts, journalists, and conspiracy theorists believe that Soros uses the Open Society Foundation as a way of getting close to people in power so that he can, in turn, get exclusive and classified information that will give him an advantage in his trading. Pay attention to how genius Soros' loop system is. He uses philanthropy to access information and then uses this information to make more money and then he uses his more money to again pump it into philanthropy, get more information, make more money again. In 1997, during the Asian financial crisis, Soros gains a substantial amount of media attention by shorting the Thai baht. Similar to his short on the British pound, sources speculate that he manages to earn an astonishing $750 million in that trade. More surprising, however, is the effect that this short had on Asian economies. According to multiple resources, the sheer amount of money that Soros used during this short managed to destabilize the economies of Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia and South Korea, getting him a reputation as an evil man in these countries and the source of many social problems. We may now think that everything is fine, but the fact is that the system is broke and it needs fixing. What you're doing is, is, is asking uh, some form of regulation to protect the world against you. Well, I am a player. And I think all players should be regulated. There have to be rules of the game. By the early 2000s, George Soros has become one of the most powerful men on earth. He's now part of the Forbes list of billionaires and is still mainly known as being the man who broke England and Asia. With billions in his bank, powerful connections from all over the world and his many philanthropic projects, George Soros has done everything he and his master Karl Popper desired. As he passes away in 1994, he's extremely proud of his student and considers him the pride of his life. Even if he could not change the world on his own, he realizes that his purpose in life all along was to teach all of his philosophy to George, the pride of his life. After Karl Popper passes away, George Soros is even more motivated to continue the legacy and will of his master and father. Now, with a family on his own and the power to change the world according to his views, there is nothing that can get in his way. Yet, as years pass by and Soros becomes more powerful and wealthy, he starts becoming more and more of a controversial figure. In the name of his open society, conservatives and right-wing intellectuals start to question the ethics and morality of his actions, accusing him of using his power for evil. Starting in the early 2010s up until 2024, Soros has allocated over $14 billion into donating money to three main causes. Climate change, migration, and social justice. Yet even if his goals seem to be altruistic, critics believe that the means he uses to achieve those goals are rather violent and destructive. On the internet and in the mainstream media, the radical right have George Soros in their sights. They claim Soros has a history of orchestrating violence across America to bring about a left-wing government. I see a lot of destruction. I think he's, uh, he's tearing things down in communities. I think he's 
you know, tearing our systems down. Soros has also been accused of funding leftist movements and chaotic protests like Black Lives Matter and being the orchestrator of the Democratic Party's win in 2020 as a result of his million dollar donations to the party. And that is just the start. Not only that, but he's also accused of flooding Europe and America with immigrants as a way of manifesting a globalist utopia. His power and presence in the world have become so vast that even politicians throughout Europe and in his own country, Hungary, start campaigns that go directly against him, blaming him for the immigration problems and others. Salvini said, Soros wants to fill Italy and Europe with migrants. He would like Italy to become a giant refugee camp because he likes slaves. George Soros recently gave open society 18 billion dollars. And his influence here and in Brussels is truly extraordinary. I fear we could be looking at the biggest level of international political collusion in history. Some other critics and conspiracy theorists take it a step further. They believe that the reason why Soros is financing these types of globalist and immigration policies is to achieve a sort of white genocide. Conspiracy theorists suggest that Soros believes that countries and societies shouldn't be led by white oppressors. Instead, he supposedly wants immigrants to flood Western countries to get rid of the same white Nazis who attacked Hungary and Europe when he was a kid. He collected some quotes from the Bowers uh, case from the Pittsburgh shooter to see how he was referring to George Soros. And he says that the gun control is pushed by Jews, open border pushed by Jews. Soros, the Jew that funds white genocide and controls the press. The person who is funding this white genocide that he's killing people for. The guy who's really behind it is George Soros. Regardless of your views on Soros, there is no denying that he is a finance master. He makes billions every year and the extent of his power is unlike anything we have ever witnessed. As of the present, Quantum Fund has around $3 billion in assets under management and is still rapidly increasing its value. On the other hand, Open Society now operates in more than 120 countries and has donated a total of over $20 billion in philanthropic endeavors. Without a doubt, out. He is the person he always wanted to be, the man who changed the world for good, according to his views. At 93 years old in 2024, he can no longer be at the forefront of his vision and projects. For even the most wealthy and powerful, there is no escaping the tragedy of time. So he decides to pass on the torch to his son, Alexander Soros, to continue growing and shaping his empire and visions. Some are relieved, but the most skeptical believe that Alexander is even worse than his father in terms of how much he wants to change the world into one that favors the left and a globalist utopia. Yet, regardless of politics and everything that is being said about Soros nowadays, there is no denying that his story of struggle, redemption and success is one to admire. From surviving the Holocaust to becoming independent at 17, to finding his purpose, to becoming a billionaire and a powerful man who was capable of changing the world according to what he believed was right. The story of George Soros can only inspire anyone to achieve their dreams and is one that will forever be remembered in the history of finance.